Hey everybody, this is your host Jeremy. I want to take a quick second at the beginning of the episode here just to let you know that we have launched a Patreon to support the show. Check us out at patreon.com slash giving the mic. Your contribution helps us cover hosting costs, edit costs, and even some equipment upgrades. Patreon is a way that you can automatically support the show each month with a donation as little as a dollar. Five dollars every month gives you access to regular premium episodes as well as the backer only special cat photo email list. You can actually see the cats of the host that you can hear in the background. Once again, that is at patreon.com slash giving the mic. I thank you, or my co-hosts thank you, and the cats thank you. Hi, I'm Jeremy. I'm a dork living in Portland, Oregon, who spent too many years listening to podcasts and not doing anything creative. This is my attempt to rectify that, to create and contribute something where I talk to people about their cultural obsessions and try to give some recommendations of my own. Welcome to Giving the Mic to the Wrong Person. One thing I did want to bring up is about... About uh, well, not, let's just say a, a form of representation. I think you that you were touching on of like how much do you like how much do you have to like not show you know how much do you have to keep out of frame mm. uh, about a um, of like you know a horrible situation. How much do you? It's at some point the the push and pull of accuracy and wanting to be true to what happened versus like not over. You know, it's like trying to. Trying to do a history of World War One, right. of like how of like yeah this was this was completely terrible from top to bottom. Like how do you not overwhelm you know how do you both inform, stay true to, but not overwhelm the um your st- you know overwhelm the the audience the the, the punter mm-hmm. you know whoever is you know, reading this of yeah. like of like a, you know complete you know um complete misery. Well, that's 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 the number one challenge. There's that supersedes everything else and part of it is uh what when going in is you have to think about um your format and your audience so my ambition is nothing less than to have this material be sold in the gift shop of the national museum in mexico city and that, i mean i want it i want it to be on like considered on an academic level i want it to be used in classes etc cetera, etc cetera. however distribution and parents and things like that means that i have to pull back on some stuff so, so far, the only two things that are not going to be in the book is the word fuck. I have shit in there. And actually, interestingly enough, fuck at the time in 1500 was, was equivalent to using the word fornicate. There was no stigma around it. The, the horrible word in 1500 was damn. <laughs> the damn religious stuff. And damn. Yeah. 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 You know, and stuff like that. So, um, you know, almost like they were a theocratic society. Funny that. Yeah. So, 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 so not using fuck is not a problem. And then the other thing is, is that no depiction of genitalia, male or female. However, oh. I cannot avoid toplessness because slave women go around topless. People working on like the women who would grind maize on the stones, you know, were, were you know, would not wear would not wear, you know, this wool, on, you know, in the, in the tropics. Mm-hmm. So, um, and, and then, yes, we have, uh, you know, scenes where women are violated. Um, but, but, you know, I, I, I try and keep the camera back. I try and, you know, like present it in a way that's, that's not, that's not, as you say, not sensational. Yeah. 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 And, and then just cross my fingers and recognize that, and hopefully people would recognize, uh, especially, you know, people are sensitive to that, you know, whatever parents or distributors, you know, like making a decision about how, where to, what stores to carry this book in, you know, like for instance, that my, 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 uh, gift shop uh, ambition. Um, so that's a tough call so far up to this point. like the couple of few topless things have been background, mm-hmm. uh, and they're all in, it's all in context. You know, um, so we'll see. We'll see what happens. I mean, when, uh, the because these days, because of the the visceralness, because each each generation has to have their hit stronger and stronger. So now we're in a place where you know you have the stuff on TV like Game of Thrones. You have movie franchises like Saw, and we're at a place now where apparently you can violence is not an issue for anybody. You, know, you can just go over the top with it. Yeah, but we still have problems about sexuality Mm -hmm. so so i'll you know cross that bridge when it comes to it well and i think a lot of it 
depends on display because the issue with Game of Thrones is a lot of it's like, mm, yeah, what's up? Yeah, you like that, don't you? <laughs> and I mean, you know, the, and there's situations where, I mean, the the whole thing with uh, Sansa and and Ramsay is yeah, rewriting that story after she turned eighteen or was it sixteen? You know, or well, 18, eighteen. Yeah, and I mean, it, and they Ugh. they changed. That doesn't happen in the books, at least not yet, as far as we know. It happens so. to an accessory character, you know, it, Jane Poole. She's not actually. She's just Sansa's friend. So they took that and they actually literally wrote that when when they first, you know, were conceptualizing the series even and waited until they could get to that point as the actress's age and then decided to depict it. And it wouldn't be a problem if they had if, if, if well, it, well, it probably would be a problem because it's a very complicated and touchy subject. Um, sexual exploitation of women has historically been used to show women's pain, but it's almost always done in through the male lens of the man's reaction to it or the man's experience with it. Well, that, you know. and that scene did it quite literally. Cause quite literally, with it, Theon it, just yeah. showing Theon, I and mean, it, yeah. I, I could imagine an alternate take of that where literally the entire thing we just focus on Sansa's face, and she just you know her pain, yeah, horrified, but then just steals up and is just like you know there's going to be another side of this and i'm gonna have this motherfucker eaten by dogs mm-hmm. spoilers for game of thrones yeah actually i had to do a scene like that uh because the malinche character i referred to earlier who's the linchpin for the whole story she's cortez's translator she's introduced to the story as a tribute and she is she and, other, and 19 other women are distributed among cortez's captains in the histories they just say and 20 women were given to Cortez's men. Some of them just even ignore that. They'll just go, and 20 women were given to cook food, to help with washing or whatever. Mm-hmm. You know, like they, they, they try and think of, they like, just magically show- what else can we have these people yeah. <laughs> they just, do? Yeah, they just magically showed up as camp right. followers. Right. So so there's never been, I mean, there's been a bazillion prose histories written about this, uh, written about the subject, but there's never, in all of them, never ever read anything that actually reminds the reader exactly what happened the night that Malinche was given to one of these captains. What did he do with her? What did, did they have a nice meal together? Did they spoon? No. No. So I have to, I, I did a scene. I did a scene like that. And, and, and that's all you can do is, is that you, 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 you try not to sensationalize it. You, uh, like I, I went, I, I don't rem- I don't, I didn't see that game of Thrones episode, but the, but the way, the way I handle it sounds similar where we just, close in on her face and she is just dealing she has this look a thousand yards there she's just like okay fuck just get this over with you know? yeah okay. well and it reminds me of what may be possibly my favorite historical comic work which is from hell mm. yeah and mm-hmm. i mean i i was just really impressed by how he handles the grotesquery of that and also the fact that he's dealing with you know victorian era prostitutes and you compare that to the movie from hell which i haven't seen but has just elizabeth uh i think um, Roller Girl, right? Uh, I'm Heather Graham. Yeah, yeah, Heather Graham, thank you. I confess I have an appetite. One day I'll be a great big ram woman. And she's just like the hottest Victorian prostitute you have ever seen. They and were not really good looking women, actually. <laughs> well, it's like, <laughs> hey, a, I'm obsessed so. with true crime and that, that particular. No open source? Yeah, yeah, no, I got all her teeth and everything. And, you know, just like, it's, damn, girl. <laughs> Was I wrong, or was it really? No, I think it, no, I think no. You were yeah. correct. Yeah. So you know, it, it's and I mean, if you're if you're telling a goofy, silly story where, you know, you want to take liberties, I guess that's one thing. But uh, you know, a lot of people seem want to seem to have it both ways, where you can basically sort of dip into the dark and disturbing grotesquery, but also you know, make it make it fun. You know, make it. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. At some point. Yeah. It's it's almost um, alternately horrifying and titillating. I was like, yeah, he's like, you can't have, you cannot have a modern HBO premiere, uh, pre- um, prestige TV show if you don't have the standard amount of like, you know, just, uh, you know, sex and violence on it. Yeah. Well, and I have to admit, I felt pretty weird about Wonder Woman watching that because, you know, the last time I checked, World War One kind of sucked for everybody. Yeah, and she's, you know, just, you know, this this cute lady who decides to you know fight for the side of righteousness and you know there, there's just this you know this was a h- horrific event and I, you know, I kind of felt the same way actually uh, playing this new wolfenstein game uh 
the first installment of this new Wolfenstein series. The New Order. Uh, yeah, where you, at one point, your character winds up in a concentration camp. And I'm like, and like, before that, I was fighting like Nazi super robots and I was enjoying that okay. But like, once I hit the concentration camp, like, I'm aware that there were concentration camps in. In, in the in the Second World War, like and so I mean, like I guess it's kind of historically accurate. I don't, and, but I, I mean, also it's just like I, f at, 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 on some level, I feel like they are taking advantage of this. Yeah, and like I just I had really mixed feelings that it kind of knocked me out they, of the they narrative. They had knots. They had they had several knots. There was uh, there was uh, that fantastic shot of the guy with the thousand yards there coming across the bridge as she walks across the bridge and she sees these people coming who were wounded walking wounded and there's a shot of this guy just like just fucked up and then the you know the woman with her crying child in the trench was the last straw that gets her to go out of the trench and then this idyllic little town where they have their nice little you know learn how to dance destroyed. is wiped out it's totally mm -hmm. destroyed they don't show the they show some bodies they don't they, like they if they I can see the filmmakers, you know, like saying, "Hey, you know what? You know, like when she goes into this orange gas town, we could, we could have a couple. We could also have a child's body. Uh, mm. No, it's maybe you shouldn't go there. So, I mean, you know, these these kinds of decisions are, you know, it, it, again, it's about your audience. You know, you like you have to you have to recognize how many people. I want as many people to see this as possible. What do I have to do to you know to compromise without completely coming you know, like a semi compromise? Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's yeah, that's the great dilemma. Yeah, well, and I think I think what you're working on is a bit different because you're not having like Kronos show up and be like, "Hey guys, what's going on?" You know, oh, um, I would totally want that to happen if I could make that happen. Yeah, and I, and, but I assume you would be handling the material differently if yeah. you did. So, uh, no, I'll have it as my as as my completely unofficial, unlicensed sidebar project, a one shot. You can it's sell your it to cons. Alternate universe fan fiction that you publish under a pseudonym. Exactly. Exactly. Well, I mean, like for, for uh, but but. Staying on this thing about like an artist's responsibility, there's, there's, if you if you want to make a statement, a uh, harsh statement about sex, drugs, violence, whatever, you have to depict it. So so if you're really good at it, uh, even your like searing anti-war film, you know, like Stanley Kubrick's Paths of Glory, devastating anti-war film, but it has a pretty damn cool trench action sequence in it. You know what I mean? There's, I mean, you know, same thing. Like Private Ryan is not an anti-war film by any stretch, no. but. Uh, you know, in in depicting the horrors of war, it, it looked kind of cool. You know, the, oh, uh, look look at the way that guy's leg blew off his body. That right. was cool. I can't remember who it was who said that it's actually impossible to make an anti-war film. Uh, I, I, um, I, I, yeah, I, that's yeah, yeah. yeah that's because like just, yeah, just the act, it's, the act, the, the act itself. Not, yeah, the other thing I wanted to, I did want to bring up is like you know how do you do that in a, in in a time when there let's just say there's a, there is a massive there is a widespread popular misunderstanding about you know that uh, about the you know that depiction must of course mean the endorsement because otherwise mm. you know mm -hmm. why would it be in there? Mm -hmm. well, I have to say I think the movie that probably got closest to that for me that was Dunkirk. I feel like Dunkirk did a really good job of pointing out like you know this is not this is not cool this is not fun you know this is not rah rah you know yeah because no because everybody was desperate and scared yeah. Yeah, I mean the only the only the only kind of romantic thing where I felt like a ten year old boy was, you know, a couple of the Spitfire sequences. Yeah, because because I grew up on you know like you know movies like you know Michael Caine's uh, Battle of Britain, and I was so excited when Michael Caine shows up in Dunkirk in his role that he was playing in Battle of Britain, <laughs> except it's you know we never see him, we just see or hear his voice. Christopher Nolan has confirmed Sir Michael Caine had a cameo in Dunkirk. Kane has been in six of the Inception filmmakers' films since 2005's Batman Begins, including Interstellar. Nolan revealed that the 84-year-old actor can be heard giving orders to Tom Hardy's and Jack Loden's characters in the new World War II epic. He said it's shocking to me that a lot of people haven't spotted the cameo when he has really one of the most distinctive voices in cinema. And also, it's Michael. He has to be in all my films, after all. Yeah, and I mean, even even that whole sequence, you know, he does his run, and it does not end well for him. So, right, right. You right. Know, there's this, yeah. there's this pain there, but but there's actually there's a little bit of nobility there. You know, he 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 torches his plane so the Germans can't get it, and he's standing there defiant as he gets captured. Mm -hmm. So I mean, there's a, he just can't help but to get romantic. I mean, like obviously, you know, uh, Nolan. He's a Brit. He grew up on the Dunkirk is a major story in British in recent British culture. And uh, so, you, you know, sometimes you're too close to the subject and you can't help but to get a little bit rah-rah, even in your anti-whatever. Yeah. 
It's just, it just sneaks through. I can't help it. Spitfires are cool. Yeah. I, I don't. I don't think there is anything wrong with a certain sense of pride or, or interest in in kind of that that national event, right? I mean, mm, that's no, there's no. nothing wrong with it at all. You know, actually, it's, no people will. Actually, that reminds me of um of uh, a great bit that I keep in my head when I'm when working on historical things, which is. Uh, when uh, in the original Star Trek show, when Kirk and his staff are, are looking at the information on Khan. Name? Khan, as we know him today. Name? Khan Nunian Singh. From 1992 through 1996, absolute ruler of more than a quarter of your world. From Asia through the Middle East, the last of the tyrants to be overthrown. Mm-hmm. And and they're going on about how well you know there was no maskers under his rule and you know he consolidated <laughs> and, and and Scotty's going. I must confess, gentlemen, I've always held a sneaking admiration for this one. He was the best of the tyrants and the most dangerous. They were Superman in a sense, stronger, braver, certainly more ambitious, more daring. What the, or no Spock? Spock's going. What the hell are you talking about? And they all laugh and they all go. You know. You can be against someone and admire him all at the same time. This romanticism about a ruthless dictator is... But Spock, we humans have a streak of barbarism in us. Appalling, but there, nevertheless. There were no massacres under his rule. And as little freedom. No wars until he was attacked. Gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Spock, you misunderstand us. We can be against him and admire him all at the same time. And Spock says... Illogical. And Kirk says... Totally. And 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 I I find myself doing that. I find myself, you know, like having sneaking admiration, so to speak, to use to use uh, Kirk's phrase, for some of these conquistadors. You know, it's like, holy shit, these guys fucking had balls. I mean, they went up against this insane situation and they just powered through it. Yeah. And it's you know, this like weird, you know, sort of just so you know perverse, obviously, but uh, you know, uh, 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 you can't help but to sort of. It touches your id in some way. Yeah, well, I, yeah. I mean, Genghis Khan was both a baller and a shot caller. So, you have to give it to him. and I mean, there's a lot of a, there's a lot of uh, Khan apologists out there. Like, you know. I mean, he is responsible for like, you know almost all of us. So. If only he if only he was a little bit taller. Well, I mean, I guess you've got tankies, right? So I guess Khan fans would be horsies. Like, mm-hmm. I mean, you know, there are people. Who, you know, he did nothing wrong. <laughs> Yeah, they're gonna. Yeah, they're, they're just, that's got to be. I mean, we're arguing about just weird, weird internet apologists and conspiracy theories on on the web. There's got to be like kind of like like con apologists. Oh, trust me. And I think it's actually a really important subject in fiction right now because I'm experiencing a lot of this and just looking at the uh, current criticism and analysis of fiction in itself. Now we're talking about historical, um, so it's not necessarily fiction, but you're still dealing with characters and narrative. And what happens usually is that people start to get this sort of ideological purity around the, that they consume. So they assume that by consuming it, they are participating in somehow into the exploitation that's being portrayed, mm-hmm. which is really, to me, is, 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 a, is a way to scrub fiction and turn it into Victorian mores and not actually get anything across. Because if we don't, if we do not delve into the darker, more horrible aspects of humanity, and you white you know completely eliminate that from people's understanding of history or anything then you're not going to yeah, you, with, I don't even understand how you could even think that that's possible. Like, the love that dare not speak its name <laughs> and we're like wait a minute the Romans practice butt stuff? I don't what are we going to do? <laughs> We can't we can't tell yeah. people about this. Yeah, it just seems weird that, that that's happening now in this time period, but it, I think a lot of it is because they are concerned about you know how historically things have been betrayed. And, sure. Yeah. You know, so. Sure. I mean, and there's this whole also a recent discussion about the idea of problematic art. Yeah. It's like there's work that I love that's that has themes in it that I don't agree with, or performers in it that I you know have issues with, or whatever. And and that's everything. Everything. Yeah, literally yeah. everything. Nothing has that. <laughs> Uh, how are you all feeling on time? I'm I I I blab. I'm, I have whole other things. We haven't even get to Patreon yet. <laughs> I'm, I'm about to I'm about to call out Paul. So like, please, on. let's do oh, this. Yeah, let's, yeah, let's, let's go Because yeah. at some point, yeah, I, yeah, I do want to get into shit. I, I get into it. Let's think. Talk about like problematic artists. That's some point that is. Um, God, that's like a, that's like a whole or two hour thing, but um, yeah. but it's, I do want to, yeah, I do well, want to bring up especially lately with the, like all these new things that have come out. Well, yeah. I love Milo Minar, like he's one of my favorite artists, um, but like oh, yeah. I guess I'm not a hundred percent convinced he should be 
drawing what he draws. Yeah, like I mean, <laughs> like, I mean, it would maybe depend on the Marvel comic. Like you could give yeah. him a Max title, and I would be yeah. fine with it. But um, and it's the same thing with Frank Cho. Like, I think Frank Cho is easily top ten. Sure. Bet- best artist working sure. today. He's a really talented guy. Yeah. And he's kind of an asshole. And yeah. you know. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. It, Absolutely. I mean, now now I can't stop. I now now I can no longer ever watch any hall again because that makes me sad. Yeah, it's mm. like watching a Polanski movie. It's like. Well, I mean, yeah. didn't he make any hall before he? Does that count? A molest- I, I don't. Well, I, I don't like, know if that. What's I don't the, know. What, Does that count? Yeah, I don't, I don't know sure. what the rules are. Like, yeah, exactly. I, mean, you know. I, there, I don't think there are any. I mean, we all have to navigate this thing, you know, uh, according to our own conscience, I guess. So. Yeah. yeah, I think it's all about like, um, it, it can, it, it's something that's historical that's problematic. Is that is 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 you know indulging in it now, contributing in any way to the sustainment of that person that. Uh, that's doing that right like i can see not wanting to do a woody allen movie because you know doing that would further his career continuously and it's to kind of say you know blanket statement that their people are kind of forgiving him for what he did but at the same token it's not like you're going to remove all those movies and get rid of them you have to i mean you have to have stuff like birth of a nation which is the worst fucking horrible shit Mm -hmm. possible to see how that was treated during that time period right. culture is you know yeah. yeah culture is not a vacuum so yeah. like yeah and 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 then the, uh, the issue i have being a film buff is how how is a collaborative art form affected when when one of the contributors to that piece is you know is evil or whatever i mean like does that screw every and land out is everybody's country and like everybody else in the entire so then now they're all, they're all tainted. Now, yeah i mean as bad as i feel for louis ck this victims i feel bad for sort of the second order victims as well like all the people who worked on that movie all the people who worked on uh pamela adlon show which i have been mm-hmm. really like i've been excited to check that out and mm-hmm. it's probably canceled now right? yeah because you know louis was an integral part of it and Right, you know, it's basically thank you. I mean, it's 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 agreed. I would totally agree that like you know, Polanski is a creep, but uh, but two of his most. But famous... Chinatown's so good, though. No, well, no, I'm well. Uh, Chinatown... The pianist is a great movie. I'm well, sorry. Chinatown and 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 Rosemary's Baby were both produced by Robert Evans, who's a very very hands on producer, and <laughs> and... <laughs> <laughs> her, 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 her. and he he uh, he um, his Robert, you can, you can sort of track the tone and the kind of vibe of Robert Evans movies more than you can track the directors that he hired to do their thing. Yeah. So, so a case can be made, and if you've seen The Kid Stays in the Picture, the documentary about Robert Evans, the case could be made that, that a movie like Chinatown is not a Roman Polanski film. It's a Robert Evans film in which he hired Polanski to do a work for hire thing, and that the film really is, the star of the film is the amazing trip of Robert Town amazing performance by the leads so i mean so and and this amazing production so so then the guy that they hired as a director turns out to be a complete fucker so so does that mean we're going to write off this picture I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. This is something I'm trying to figure out. I, what we I, need to do is we need to set up an you. island where we can just set all of these problematic people and we also set up <laughs> the a, island the island of misfit problematic people <laughs> and and they can just keep making movies and they parachute in and they, there's like weapons around well okay that's going in a different direction and we're slowly accumulating we... enough of oh, these creeps to, to, to actually yeah produce like, crews you get kevin spacey to star in an all-male performance with the, well okay wait hold on no they this do an apologist shit. film um it's actually going to be a miniseries where they all have to play the roles of the, the the women and children that they exploited yeah i mean there's a there's a tradition of uh you know male actors playing female roles so yeah. you know it's fine mm-hmm. and you know weinstein can produce and you know mm-hmm. we're good mm-hmm. I'm, I'm very excited about this a very problematic a pr- very problematic production of some like it hot yeah problematic island <laughs> make it a reality tv show yeah. Every, in, every house has its own problematic. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I'm confident that Greta Van Susteren's new app will take care of this. <laughs> Where you can apologize to people. <laughs> Did you hear about that? Oh, my no, God. Yeah, she's she releases, like, completely insane Facebook po- like post about how she's developing an app, and she keeps spelling it in capital letters, so it was like, app, app. And it was like, so I'm going to come out with this amazing new app and it's free and I'm developing myself and my husband thinks it's a great idea. People just need to use the app all the time. And it's basically this idea where you have a public apology 
Uh-huh. And people get to vote on whether it was good enough or not. <laughs> she watched that episode of the Orville and got That's really excited. Happened. That's no. exactly what happened. <laughs> so, yeah, it's like, half, half, yeah, it's a good. It's what, it's what happens when so, when someone reads Shirley Jackson and Black Mirror and takes the wrong lessons from there. <laughs> Greta's Greta's an interesting person. Yeah, she also has a, a new book out. She's a Scientologist. Is, it's called Everything You Need to Know About Social Media, and I imagine Roy Moore gets like really excited about this. <laughs> And, but then he reads the subtitle, which I is. Anyway. <laughs> but then he hears the subtitle without having to call a kid, and Roy Moore's just like, "Meh, I'll pass." Oh god! <laughs> like... Thank you for going there. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for going there. I, I just actually one of the things about the zeitgeist that's happening in terms of this, um, you know, more visibility and people being less afraid to speak out. While I think it's I think it's really positive and it's you know wonderful and changed and stuff like that. I feel like a lot of it's still pretty classist in the sense that you have so many people. Like, I mean, the statistics are very clear. It's like one in three or one in four women have had it's been have had that experience. And you know, including myself, I'm very open about it because I feel like it needs to be talked about. But like, we're, we're you know, it's kind of like the it's like lost in a sea of noise. Like the true kind of stories and like what how to really deal with that like how our criminal justice system has no justice for this and how women that speak out after years and years are questioned because the fact that they held on to that information for so long like yeah i just i hope that this actually creates a force of positive change but right now it's just it, it's been very difficult to see all that stuff online every day and well yeah it's absolutely classist i mean you're you're talking about everybody's come for they're celebrities they're celebrities. It doesn't necessarily, you know, um, uh, a race thing. It's just, it's just, it's just a celebrity thing. It's like the more famous they are, when they screw up, the more you're going to hear about it. So you're not going to hear about, like, for instance, I saw some posts the other day about what about all of the housekeepers in all those hotels all over the world. Yeah, I was a housekeeper for a yeah. short period of time right. myself in 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 Phoenix, yeah. and you know, I've had some very interesting interactions with the guys because I did I did night shift, and. Oh boy. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't. I was I never felt unsafe, but at the same token, like I, I was in a place of privilege. I was the, one of the very few white people on staff. You know, what would be it like for somebody else, like mm-hmm. that doesn't have that place of power? Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, it's it's one of those things where it's sort of just like you 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 you're kind of happy, but you're not because you get more and more angry as you think about the fact that the way that it's being covered in the media and the way that it's the focus is shifting on all of these different things is not is not true to what. A positive change can come from it you know like maybe we we can become more vocal when things like that happen and you know get these predators punished in some way but in in terms of punishment how 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 does that even work you know like sorry i'm just ranting no no no, no, no. i hear you, well, just, I hear you. I hear you. Uh, one aspect of this that i find really frustrating is like i saw people with with louis ck talking about like oh well i mean you know it was obvious because that dude you know tells a bunch of jokes about masturbation and i'm like well i mean come on that's not that's not, it. <laughs> that's not how that works and i mean if like chinatown is actually a pretty remarkable film in as much as you know it, it at the core of it is a woman who is victimized and used and you know the end of the film is basically you know this this woman who is destroyed by men mm-hmm. and you it's know not, yeah, is not allowed to escape and who's you know basically in this powerfully patriarchal system and it you know i mean like there's a really powerful feminist reading of chinatown that's very easy to make and that was made by somebody who is continued to be accused of rape so you know i i i i really get frustrated by these people who are like you know oh well this person you know writes about this subject so they must be a fan and well no you but there's a difference between the director and the writer robert town well, in terms of just you know producing media, yeah, you know, I yeah. mean, directors do choose their projects. So, in in Chinatown's case, town, I mean, no, um, uh, Evans brought in. Uh, it was it was Evans's pet project. He'd been wanting to do it for a while, mm-hmm. and he brought in um, Polanski because 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 he liked what he had done with Rosemary's Baby. He wanted that kind of like this overall menace to tone. Well, I actually haven't seen Rosemary's Baby, but I have heard it, uh, you know, praised for that as well. Oh, it's great. Yeah, you should see it just for the God is Dead scene. Yeah. (laughs) God is dead! Satan lives! The air is one!
And, uh, you know, I, Ruth I, Gordon. A lot of people uh, are, I've noticed are taking shots at Bernie Sanders again because of that dumb thing he wrote back in the, the 70s about, you know, uh, women fantasizing about getting raped. And the thing is, though, he's, he, I mean, like, that is a thing that women fantasize about. Like, that is a big part of uh, female erotica, actually. It is. And, yeah. you know, there, there's a but I mean, there's a very real distinction between the things people think about, the things people write about and things people fantasize about. Fiction and is not reality. I mean, that is basically what we have to fight against. And it's especially pleased for women. Women are always pleased for this. And it comes back from that Victorian thing where it was talking about, you know, and kind of one of my heels to die on is the fact that people equate the content that you consume with a sense of a moral character uh it's not, you know, when it absolutely is not. It's just uh -huh. that you have to explore darker narratives in order to understand the human, the full spectrum of humanity. Yeah, if you were to judge, you know, on, on reading material, that would make Japan the most fucked up place on the planet. <laughs> and I've been there, and it's not. Jesus. You can leave your door unlocked there. Because they, they sublimate all that through their comic books. <laughs> yeah. The, um, yeah, at some point, I think there's a way to get into about the, the just the idea of ickiness, of, like, of ickiness connecting to, um... We call it squick. Yeah, squick. Yeah, squick and ickiness. But yeah, it's the the sense of physical disgust, physical disgust, um, getting getting kind of associated or cross linked with, um, you know, moral judgment of something. You know, you know, just kind of disgust is bad. Right. The Ludovico technique, I think, is referred to as. Well, oh, that's Cocker Orange. Thank you. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> Where, yeah, yeah. You have to associate action. With where, where they get him to, they brainwash him by showing him repulsive stuff, mm. and then give him a drug that makes him feel repulsed, so that he has that association. Yeah, it was Ludwig van. It's a thing! It's a thing! It's a thing! I'm sorry, Alex. This is for your own good. Great movie. or something like that right yeah this thing this thing still has 36 hours of um wow yeah i just don't want to like i don't want to like all oh. right here we go get ready <laughs> jacob <sighs> is gonna be here all night 24 hour yeah 24 hour podcast podcasting uh 24 hour part uh podcast people um i do uh, i do want to at some point talk about patreon both in terms of like because i know that you're you know the book you're working on is on patreon but also and i think both of you might be able to to um, talk about this if, um, of just like Patreon as potential for <laughs> uh, we mentioned Scott McCloud yeah it's like at some point yeah Patreon is it's at some point it's a it's a form of what Scott McCloud was trying to like write about 25 years ago of um, you know of like, of like setting up microtransactions to get you know to have people have their stuff funded mm -hmm. yeah absolutely I I just started it uh, just a couple months ago, and uh, I need to I need to press more on that. I, it's it's always been very difficult for me to be self promoting to hustle. It's just not my part of my thing. I think that's um, a pretty common artist issue. Yeah, yeah, yeah it is. So uh, so I I did this Patreon thing, and I set up pretty low tier thresholds. You know, like um, I mean, I do have. I just decided to add some crazy shit, like a hundred dollar tier for people that are nuts. But uh, mostly, mm. it's just one dollar and five dollar. And the thing that I appreciate about this is that there's no deadline. Like in Kickstarter, it's it's a it's a, and it's all or nothing. Yeah, so not only do you have to raise this by this deadline, if you don't, then you're back to square one, which always threw me. It's like, well, wait a minute, what about all these people? But can't you at least can't at least have that? <laughs> yeah. Five bucks for my ten thousand goal? Can I have the nine thousand and nine hundred? Yeah, um, unless you get Indiegogo. Yeah, and then the other thing about Kickstarter, which is problematic for me, is the amount of fulfillment that you have to. I mean, you set up all these rewards. Yeah, and then you have to. I mean, I've had, we've had people in our studio do successful Kickstarters. And then they spend Lucy the next... Lucy Yeah, yeah. I've been phenomenal. Uh, also, Erica Mullen, you know, her Ojoy Sex Toy series is uh, the, the new Kickstarter's for it. I love her work. Yeah, it's it's hugely successful. And then they have to hire people to come in and fill, fill their orders yeah. for the next three months. Yeah, we even... Uh, previ previous guests on the show, uh, Lillian with her... Um, was that Indiegogo or Kickstarter? I think it was like, might have been a Kickstarter program. Where, yeah, we had... When we had on... When, one of our other guests... Um, who oh my does, dollar! Yeah, who does the? She does her uh, 
uh, who does the Oh My Dollar podcast and website, mm-hmm. she had she just had in fact still has a successful pot successful Kickstarter going, and yeah, it's that it's that it is that fulfillment aspect. We ha- um. Uh, my girlfriend has was is good friends with someone who had a very successful Kickstarter for a kind of like a a, a home salted caramel business, but it was the fulfillment and the fa- and scaling the fulfillment mm-hmm. and that uh, that ultimately you know, a lot of complications happened in, in kind of like the fulfillment would have it all I've went never wrong. heard of any Kickstarter that did not have complications yeah. during its fulfillment phase, <laughs> especially if they hit stretch goals because you're just continuously creating these milestones and then you have. To, you don't actually have the time to like really consider yeah. the logistics of it. Yeah, I mean, outside of Star Citizen, I don't think there's ever been like a perfect Kickstarter program. Yeah, and that way, yeah, that way, and that that's gone off without a hitch for so long too. <laughs> <laughs> well, and then the beauty of Patreon is that there is no end game. There's, I mean, like you can you can lay down like by the time I'm finished, you know, when I'm finished with page ninety nine, then I'm done, and thanks everybody, and here's some copies yeah. but uh but really it's it's an ongoing thing so and and i do have rewards for the you know for the higher tiers uh because the re- rewards for the for this lower tiers like the dollar and five dollar thing are basically that you get access to all these posts where i go on and on about the process like mm-hmm. uh, for every single page i have end notes and stuff like that so i use the material i'm collecting anyway and talk about uh every single page in detail I mean, from from scripts all the way up to the colors. And so that's what you get for your buck a month. You get multiple, like, you know, half a dozen posts of whatever through the course of the month. And then it's, I think, in the $20 range or $25 range is where I start actually giving out stuff that people might be interested in. So I'll do, like, for the $20 people a month, I'll make little sketch cards of the characters. Mm. And then uh, I found that uh, anything... Regarding like like ephemera though like uh, like print like uh, uh, not original stuff but like um, prints mm-hmm. or printed cards or things like that uh, people don't really want. I mean, I, I did a Kickstarter that was successful and I got a bunch of prints and I put them in I put them in recycling. Oh, no. like, what am I what am I going to do with these things? I don't want it. Bring them to con and like just get them out. Yep. <laughs> so 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 for so for me, uh, I mean, like I need to hustle the Patreon more because at this point, I'm asking for a grand a month to fully fund the thing, and I'm only getting fifty bucks because I have fifty patrons who are just giving a buck. Yeah. What what is your Patreon address? Out of curiosity, it's patreoncom slash Guinan, as in the Whoopi Goldberg character on Star Trek. Okay, how do you spell that? G U I N A N. Yeah, the uh, I tried Thank to put. You, sir. Welcome. I was just say happy the, to help. Yeah, the um, yeah, it's helpful to have co-hosts because otherwise I'm because I'm lost in my own head half the time. The the show, I mean, this show itself has its own Patreon, which has one supporter who I live with. Um, <laughs> you know, that, and that page is patreoncom slash mug, ladies and gentlemen. Anyway, uh, help support producing the show. Yeah, it's really hard until you get visibility. Um, for us in terms of thinking about starting a Patreon eventually because like you know we have an illustrator we have someone who's going to be doing more video production you know like we will have supplemental content but it's deciding how you want to market that and it's hard to do up front yeah and I'm coming from uh, I'm coming from I, 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 my whole career got set back to you know to, to zero at the beginning because I I spent a decade not in comics. Mm-hmm. Uh, I did this book Boilerplate and then I did a follow-up book Frank Reed and those are as I was mentioning earlier those are like time life history books with columns of text and photos. They're not really they don't, you know, there's no panel borders or blunts or whatever. So if you're out of comics for more than a few years, you might as well start from scratch. And I've been out of comics for ten years. You, so so for so you know nobody I don't I don't expect anybody to know what my story is or my background is or anything like that. And uh, so if, if uh, I imagine the Patreon kicking in once I complete a couple episodes and start putting them out there, and people can really start seeing the work, yeah. and then they'll get excited about it. Let's see, um, yeah, you you what you need is one of those um, really classy. And if you have to be of a certain age to remember these, but the really classy Time Life book commercials. <laughs> That's right. Now, Time Life Books announces an important new library, Mysteries of the Unknown, a series that explores the most controversial phenomena of our time and tells you everything that can be known. Um, yeah. But in, Jacob brings up, um, brought up a thing uh, off mic, but that even Kickstarter finally, hilariously, you know, 
a year or two after, you know, it's, it's kind of, it's funny how it's, it's taking them a couple of years. They are finally getting into the Patreon thing themselves, but they're called, have you heard what they're calling their Patreon knockoff service? Jacob, do you want to tell them? Drip. <laughs> really? Yeah. Oh yeah. D-R-I-P. <sighs> they had meetings for that. Yeah. Somebody got paid a lot for that. Yeah, somebody got paid for that. And it's no, it, 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 is that a is that like a, a a a coffee startup? No, that's a what a you know multi million dollar company threw money at developing. I can't even you, know, you think they, they call it like Dripper or something. I don't know. It's like it's just it's nothing, yeah. There's nothing when you want to come up with a um, with your own platform name to really compete with a um, an extremely successful service you want something that named a name that suggests suggests incontinence <laughs> why, not, why not just kick goer i mean that's right there yeah. just, you can have that for free i don't know i'm i'm just constantly fascinated by things that get funded or don't get funded like david chelsea who is you know a new york times published artist who has done work for basically every big name you can think of except for the new yorker you know is pulling down i want to say like 65 bucks a month yeah and he's got a ton of people who actually follow him online but i think a lot of it is that he has a older audience who don't understand how these you know ding dang microtransactions work and mm -hmm. on the other side of it you have a comic like hot blood which is a gay cowboy centaur comic which nice you know, I'm not throwing shade at, but I guess I was a little surprised when I found out it got like over twenty five thousand dollars funding <laughs> oh for God. a print version. Like, I, I guess I wouldn't have expected there was that big of an audience no, out there for it. There's, and, a, there's an audience. Like, for it. it's a hundred percent on my back, but like, you know, well, I, I get, with other people I get particularly it. annoyed when I see uh, uh, these patreons that are wildly successful, thousands and thousands of dollars, and the material is essentially print farming they're saying like this one person is hugely successful drawing very manga-ish versions of marvel characters and it's like jesus christ how does how does she get away with that mm -hmm. oh there's a there's an artist who is making big bucks doing marvel comics porn and he actually he or she i don't know uh hires artists to do this work and like these, they're very nice comics. Like I like the art is, in my opinion, professional. Is there a level. good story to it, or uh, I actually haven't read oh, them, but I mean, um, like I'll have you to know, check it out. Well, sex I, will always. I'll, I'll yeah. see what I. I'll, I'll check my internet history and see what I can dig up. But uh, <laughs> like it, it'll be hard to find through all the other stuff I search for. When your in incognito window. Yeah, I know there's but, something. Yeah, there's something. There's a there's actually a, a group of people who are making like some really disturbing hardcore video game porn content and they're getting like you know thousands of dollars yeah. a month to basically yeah. you know have tomb raider like get sexually assaulted and you can crowdsource your kink now basically yeah, yeah. i mean oh, yeah. you know it's, it's, a, it's a it's a it's a brave new Horny and world. I guess it's all covered under parody or something. It's not. It's just that you know, it's who's going to catch you? Like, I mean, or who's going to admit? You know, hey, who's going to admit wanting to? Uh, you know, knowing about it well enough to uh, to catch you? <laughs> yeah. They should call it like you know, like kink sorcerer or something like that, or kink starter. Yeah, dear Marvel, this is forums poster Horny Toes sixty nine, <laughs> and I'm here to tell you about an outrageous copyright violation. Like, yeah. Especially probably because that person would just was upset about certain like the content <laughs> like yeah. no bucky and cap are together excuse me yeah the, uh, and one of the things that i am remembering is because of to tie it back to the 24-hour comic book movie so i think it, it, at one point you know i think multiple members multiple artists on you know in the film talk about just that they had you know about their um I guess their own particular, you know, struggles about getting funded, and the film was shot in say 2013, which was when did Patreon? It's Patreon started in like what, a year or two later, and really became a thing in the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of, and I remember asking asking the panel at the Portland premiere of the documentary about just the effect of Patreon. It's almost like it, at some point, in a certain extent, not really, uh, sort of solving the. It's almost like solving this problem, or at least you know, adding, uh, adding a funding mechanism that had been you know openly longed for in the middle of the documentary. Right. I mean, one of the reasons uh, that the documentary took forever to make is because Milan was doing it on weekends on his own time when he could. You know, he didn't uh, he didn't uh, 
look for funding. It, mm-hmm. was, it was just a personal project. Yeah, this, this is what the show is, is nights and weekends, so. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's, and for a long time, I mean, uh, I was working with my friend David on this, on this essay thing without, with both of us just doing it on our own dime. Mm-hmm. And it was only until uh, I realized that we're, this is never going to happen. This is going to take years and years if I don't pony up some dough. And so I dug into a little little nest egg that I had, and, and I was able to give David a, a page rate. And as a result, we now have enough material that we're putting together to be able to shop it to a publisher where we can make the crazy huge money. Yeah. <laughs> do, do you have any Do you have any more stuff that you like? You maybe need somebody to do flats for you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, you know, it's uh, we were just talking about it because because he has caught up with me in my writing. Um, I um, I uh, I was not I was not taking advantage of the time where I had uh, I was not being as as efficient as I could. So he's now caught up with me. So I'm now having to race to keep ahead of him. And one of the things uh, that we've set up um, to to give me a little bit more time is for him to. T- for him to do flatting for me and i was i remember you know uh, we were talking about this and and uh making fun of the idea of like um david who's a t- consummate professional has been working in top tier dc projects for some time now you know uh doing flats <laughs> it's, it's just, you know, it's, and we were talking about is that is that you know above your or below, whatever above below your pay station or whatever it is or your whatever totem pole well i'm confident david chelsea will give me an excellent reference <laughs> 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 we'll talk after the show. Yeah, okay, qu- I say question from the. Uh, I'm an engineer. What is uh, what is flatting? Flatting is where um, when you're doing computer colors, usually in um, Photoshop or uh, Clip Studio, um, you have somebody go in and just take all the basic forms and just lay down a plane of color. You don't mm-hmm. try and render it or anything like that. It's basically just creating it's you know it's like the color by number kind mm-hmm. of paintings but it's just it's just there for just to give you like, uh, like, like paint bucketing and do right. certain okay so that, so that the colors can go in and not have to spend all that time tracing out all of the figures and filling them you know and filling out the backgrounds so the colors can go in and start doing change well obviously change the color like i didn't like that green that he used i'm going to use this green and then start doing the modeling on top of that so it it, it just saves them the roach it's it's like when you get to somebody who's an inker assistant and what he's doing is he's ruling out the panels he is filling in the blacks he's doing stuff that isn't creative i mean i mean it's you know it takes a skill it's more much more rote and mechanical right. rather than right exactly and the, the advantage of that is that once you've done that basically if you have one character who's a particular skin color you can actually use Photoshop to select all examples of that, so you can work through that entire thing in one sweep. You actually have to be a little bit careful with the paint bucket, because if you're working on layers, when you go to print, uh, if it doesn't go underneath the blacks and you're actually uh, sending a layered file to the to your printer, uh, it'll come out looking really weird because your blacks mm-hmm. will be inconsistent. But that's a little right. insane. I, well, yeah, baseball, I, I, I tend to avoid that by flattening my files. Before Chelsea does them. the same thing. I, mm-hmm. I've noticed that a lot with your yeah. Your, I, don't, your I, don't, I don't more mature artists. Yeah, just just send them the flat. Don't send them layered file. Send them yeah. the flat file. Yeah, I mean, not even the balloons. I mean, even the balloons are flat. You know, I send them the the you know the take the illustrator because I do the balloons in Illustrator. David Chelsea does his in InDesign, which is so weird to me. Okay. Like, does InDesign have the vector scaling? I, think so yeah okay. but i mean it's That's just like need. indesign is just such a clunky difficult yeah. to work with well it's it's what you shit. it's you've got to work with what you know i mean like for instance i have yet to fully adopt the cintiq which is mm-hmm. something that i absolutely should be oh. working on oh my god i still i still use the bamboo uh, tablet thing yeah. when i started working with chelsea he was using his cintiq as a monitor <laughs> I was just like, like, okay, why would you? They, they, uh, right. I'm so mad. Ladies and missing, missing the whole point of that technology. Yeah. <laughs> Wacom is a manufacturer of such products as the bamboo and the Cintiq, mm-hmm. located here mm-hmm. in the lovely Pacific Northwest. In the, I, yep, in the I, Pearl I, District. The I briefly worked for them uh, as a guy working on repairs in a little like month long contract like seven years ago. Any yeah. free samples? Uh, no, I just fixed several of the monitors because of they would come back and yeah, a lot of uh, a lot of like of um, of like a lot of like fine tooth brushing out of dust particles oh, right. in an office that was not a clean room yet needed clean ro- clean room um, uh, requirements. Helioscope has a relationship with Wacom where we get uh, 
you get some you get to do some beta testing for them Aww. uh they'll give us you know not the big fancy pieces but they'll give us some some equipment to um to test and then to part of the deal is is that if they're going to give us some stuff we got to blab about it in social media okay. did you happen to uh, do you know any uh you know any of the engineering managers that are by name <laughs> uh, I, I just know. No, no, I, I, I'm trying to get a job there again. I know Dave I'm and, and Doug and Stephanie, and that's about it. <laughs> yeah, you, you don't know Mr. Wackham? <laughs> not, 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 no, no. Mr. Tablet. Yeah. Right. Well, I mean, I, I, getting getting back to the Patreon thing is just what what really I find amazing about that. Also, is like there's a string of people who are also pretty regularly on Twitch, but also making YouTube videos. So, uh, Baked Alaska has a Patreon. He's this wacko alt right guy who Isn't just got no, 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 no. He just got banned from Twitter. Actually, um, didn't he does Christian Twitch streaming? Or like, I think he either reads or has Bible verses read to him. Okay, which is <laughs> that, sounds, uh, that sounds like some like a really particularly sub niche version of ASMR or something. It's a um, unique take. Wait, did I did wait? Is he still on Patreon or did he have to go off to the little like little like anime Nazi Patreon? Like, the Hatreon, yeah. Uh, I think he's still on Patreon, but I'm okay, not sure. Okay, like Patreon like, Prime. Those guys get kicked on and off all the time, but like, there's a lot of guys out there who are like, you know, let, let me tell you why Atomic Blonde is an example of the, you know, feminist Marxist agenda. And they're like making a thousand dollars a month, and it's just, I'm, I'm, you know, I have never actually looked into the terms of service with regards to what you can and can't post on Patreon. Well, they're actually weirdly inconsistent as far as sexual content. Mm. And, like, I remember there was a big controversy about that with, like, uh, I, th- I want to say Natasha might know more about this than I do. Which one? Uh, just female artists who were having some problems with, basically, the terms of service and, you know, more adult oh, content. Oh, I haven't really looked, I heard much about that. Yeah. Um, I nothing, nothing, nothing's ringing a bell. For me. But I, I can, uh, the, you know, if they have a por- pornography um, stipulation, then they can kind of read that however they want to. Yeah, well, and I'm, I know the uh, the Daily Showa uh, white supremacist uh, podcast was on Patreon for a while, and I, I think it's still on there, and I think uh, they're using, like, a secret fake thing where they're like, you know, like, this is a totally normie podcast that's not about you know white oh, power yeah like, no I've, I've i've encountered a lot of those actually where it's very disguised but then you start listening and it's just like conservative women are hotter and uh you know <laughs> it's i always question the people that disguise their their politics because that means that they they are insecure about it they exactly. question it themselves it's yes. like you you know be proud be loud mm-hmm. it's, it's okay to be white <laughs> <laughs> There's there, there's a uh, there's actually I don't I don't I, I don't even want to I just realized I don't even I just found a Patreon that it, I don't even want to say on the mic because anything it's like at some point anything that you say on mic is just going to drive traffic but at some point it just there's a right. group in, uh, in in Lancaster I think Lancaster California just is creating firearm yeah really yeah it's um it's oh, it's something disturbing okay yeah. all right all right um. I want to uh, tra- at some point we've been going for a while, so I didn't want to transition to just uh, wrapping things up for like endorsements or anything or uh, recommendations and endorsements. So um, one of the things that we do do is if anything that we've been digging on that we want to share with uh, with the audience of a lot of it, like you know what what particular thing have you been consuming that you're like this is awesome and, and you know y'all need to hear about it. Um, it, you know, it's, it's tough for me at any given time because whatever I'm consuming is directly related to the project I'm working on. Mm-hmm. So for the last year, you know, I've just been reading nothing but histories and biographies of that subject. So it's, uh, it's, uh, so I got nothing. <laughs> well, is there any of those, um, of those, of all the stuff that you've been, you've been reading, is there any particular, any things that really stand out as like, that you really want to like, you know, grab the book and kind of like wave it over your head, like in a crowd scene, hey, everybody, you know, you really need to read this. Like well, a, there's, oh, I'm sorry. I was going to say, a, yeah. is there a particular history that you read that? Mm-hmm. Well, there's a, there's a, there's a bazillion of them. There's a, one from 1990s called, uh, called, um, Conquest by, um, by Hugh Thomas, which is an amazing book, tremendously detailed. And, you know, it's relatively accessible. It's not like one of these sort of heady academic tomes. You know, it reads like an adventure story, but it's like crazy thick. It's like hundreds of pages. I've heard good things. A couple of years ago, a year or two ago, 
there was a guy who revisited that material uh, as a sh breezy pop history. It's only a couple hundred pages long. This That's Buddy Levy, and I think it's called Conquistadors. And that that's probably, as far as a current take on the subject, probably the most accessible. It's not, you know, it's not a giant tome. I mean, he moves through the material pretty quickly, but yet gives you just enough detail so that, you know, it's has a nice full thing. But aside from that, I, I, I go to the I go to the primary sources. There's this one, I mean the the history for where, where pretty much everything comes from is this memoir that this one conquistador wrote. His name is Bernal Diaz. And he wrote this book called The True History of the Conquest of New Spain. And it's in Penguin, and it's you know it's one of these, you know it was written five hundred years ago. It's public domain, and there's a bazillion different translations. But the Penguin one of Diaz Conquest of Mexico is is the primary source. I mean, it's a first person account, and he's on the scene, and he's you know he's giving you all kinds of details, and and all history books come from that source. There was one other thing that was written a little bit after the conquest by Cortez's own secretary, and uh, and. Uh, Diaz read that book and he was really upset with inaccuracies. So he wrote his own book, his memoir based off of this. So there's, there's only two books that were written any time within the people's lifetimes. And then everything else comes from those sources. So like, hmm. I mean, everything else, the only, the only new information that, 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 that augments those two primary sources are anthropological and, and archeological uh, finds. The, and that's it that's it you know further studies of codexes you know uh, recently recently the uh, some languages were deciphered just within the last couple of decades they deciphered the mayan glyph language and you know and, and they keep discovering you know new th things like that mm. but in terms of the actual adventure story so to speak you know the on the ground uh plot thing there's just one 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 or two books mm. so yeah so that's uh and that kind of makes it easier in terms of like the way that I plotted everything. I could only I only needed two or three books to, to lay out all the plot. And then the problem is is when you go to individual scenes and you and you're dealing with these characters and their and their interactions. Because not only am I having to research the story, I'm having to research every aspect of the instrumentalities on both sides. So like even just some simple things that you would take for granted, just like I have a scene in, in the Spanish camp and they're cooking. Well now I need to look up cooking utensils from 15 whatever i need to you know figure out how do they you know kettles over fires like how they with the and they had they had these armatures these little and it was super interesting how did they harness a, a horse on a sailing ship i have to look up all that I, that's okay. just every every detail has to be done it's pretty insane so uh so there <laughs> Parts on credit as historian now. That's great. Yeah. I will though. I will though plug my uh, last two books, which will give you a sense of like the kind of insanity that I'll bring to bear on this new project, and that is the boilerplate histories of mechanical marvel, which you can find on Amazon or whatnot. You can even order through us through our website, uh, and which is bigredhair.com. There you go. Which is named after my wife's tresses. She has big red curly hair. And, uh, yeah, and she's also the co-author of Boilerplate and the follow-up Frank Reed, which I saw a copy of laying, I'm just looking at it right now, a copy of it laying over there in the corner. And uh, so, and both those books, Boilerplate and Frank Reed, have their own little section on our website, as does Aztec Empire. So if you go to bigredhair.com, you will find links to our books and with samples, because we put up um, little samples from the books. And, in fact, the Boilerplate section and the Frank Reed section both have an interactive timeline, which which Anina uh, put together, which I'm super proud of her work on. It's it's an amazing thing where you can like do the swipe scroll through the entire history of these characters, mm -hmm. cool. and uh, it's it's turned out really well. <laughs> so, awesome. So there you go, BigRedHair.com. Well, I, I only had one rec, and it was it's kind of ironic because I wasn't really thinking about the connection studio wise. Um, I didn't actually realize that. Uh, so what I'm wrecking actually is um, uh, I've recently became friends with Lucas Kettner, mm -hmm. who's obviously your your coworker. Mm -hmm. um, he uh, he's released just released Kill the Minotaur. Mm -hmm. The last issue came out yeah. last week, I think, and uh, it's a very beautiful book, and I think a really interesting short retelling of the tale in a way that actually seems more interesting and more rich and more you know obviously mm -hmm. Theseus versus the Minotaur is a story that's been told over and over again. 
but I think the take that they've taken on it, um, the writer is Chris Palmetto. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> Pacetto, Chris Pacetto. Sorry, Chris. Um, and I, I really appreciate uh, Lucas's art style. Um, he, I think his most known work is probably Witch Doctor, right. which came out um, under Robert Kirkman's yes. label. Mm-hmm. And it's, I, I just find his creature creation extremely, extremely like gorgeous and in complex and interesting and the fact that he's able to create these really really detailed and rich illustrations is a sign of his talent it's really fun to see his reference work often artists will po- you know have their yeah. little reference work that they've printed out or that they have on their you know one of their two or three monitors that they're in their workstation mm-hmm. and it's so much fun to see how much work that he's put into the research and how he will interpret it because the the book is taking a, a supernatural approach yes and the you know a, and some of the details of that culture just didn't survive through history mm-hmm. so you, yeah you, know, you, you never say, you never get the minotaur side of that <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's fun to see him extrapolate based on what historical information there is and to have him sort of run with that to sort of mm-hmm. take it to the next level yeah it's definitely got a little bit more of this kind of magical right. element to it, which is really, yep. really fascinating. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yep. Oh, I was going to say also, just mm. to plug that, sorry, the, what it was, was that he has an exhibit going at Sequential Art Gallery mm-hmm. um, over right. in Northwest right now. It's going to go through November. I just checked the Facebook. Um, oh, I'll, I'll plug the shit out of that. Because yeah. Cable Hashtani runs an old friend I of mine. I love Cable. Oh. He's great. I call him the uh, art mayor of Portland. He is. And... Um, I've been lucky enough to do some shows there. Uh, very proud to have been. I had a couple, three shows over the last decade there. Uh, his, he, all of his, I try and hit every single, if I'm in town and I'm not going through some kind of neurotic social anxiety thing, I will totally hit every first Thursday that the cable uh, does. Nice. That's their uh, space. That, yeah, over at Northwest Broadway. Right. Uh, in uh, the Pearl in Portland, Oregon. Right. It's a. Uh, I think that's the. There's like a building complex. Uh, I forget the name of it, but it's it's a bunch of artist lofts in which uh, they they have a gallery space and then upstairs they have a living space. So on first Thursdays, it's a nice little gallery walk. Oh, the Everett Street lofts. That's what it's called. Everett. Okay. And so Broadway. Yeah, so Northwest of Everett and Broadway. Yeah. yeah. So if you're yeah on on a first Thursday, get over to Everett and Broadway and check out the street scene. Well, you know it's it's actually getting into the rainy day, but you know in on nice weather, it's like a mini artists Mardi Gras thing going on there. A lot of eclectic types, street musicians, all kinds of. It's really really cool. Yeah. Uh, for me, in keeping with the, I guess, general historical theme of the episode, I'm going to throw out two recommendations. The first would be Bombshells by Marguerite Bennett, which is a look at DC characters set in the 40s. Mm-hmm. And I, I'm a big fan of Marguerite Bennett. Like, I think she's a, one of the best people working at DC right now. And uh, on, I'm also going to recommend this uh, Uber uh, by Kieran Gillen, which is a comic that is about what if superpowers were developed as a weapon during World War II. And it's probably one of my favorite superhero type projects right now because it's very careful at stripping out a lot of the trappings and tropes mm-hmm. of the traditional superhero genre. And it treats them like weapons. It asks, you know, how do you deal with this tactically? How do you have a super powered human being interact effectively in a combat situation that's a and, really great take on it mm-hmm. uh, so that's a really great take on it. i like karen karen gillen's work is really good oh he's fantastic I, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan and he also manages to really effectively portray the horror of war uh, it, mm. it's probably the one avatar comic that i would unreservedly recommend because most of the avatar comics are like what if hp lovecraft had rape in it or <laughs> you know what if what if zombies raped people and you know and that's, graphic black and white yeah and uh, yeah and avatar is just very like that's the avatar thing like they take these top talent art, uh, writers like you know alan moore and you know uh garth ennis and they're like you know just w- we want this to be as grindhouse as possible but mm-hmm. i feel like Uber is the one comic they've done that I think is a legitimately great work. I have some issues with some of the art in that, in as much as that some of it's kind of bad, but it's Avatar. Yeah, I, 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 it really manages to capture how horrific uh, war is, and like Gillen has obviously just done a spectacular amount of research into 
you know, how the military figures of the time thought, how those campaigns worked, and, you know, how they would be affected by having this, you know, new technology emerge. And, you know, it's one of my favorite comics on the stands right now. Mm-hmm. Actually, I am, I'm recalling that there is a comic book series I love that is not put out by one of my collaborators at Helioscope. And that is um, from an old pal of mine, Xander Cannon, uh, Kaiju Max. And I'm not, you know, I, I love kaiju movies, but uh, I come at them with um, an appreciation of uh, being a fan of dioramas. So for mm-hmm. me, you know, one of these Japanese monster movies is I speed search through the annoying scenes with the kid. <laughs> and I just go right to the part where these people are, are destroying these beautiful, beautiful downtown miniatures that somebody yeah. spent hours and hours <laughs> putting together. That's my favorite thing about watching these movies. But Xander's an old friend, and I'll, I'll read anything he does. He's got this wonderful, subversive quality between the seeming tone of the piece and the actual content. So for Kaiju Max, it, it, it just looked like a candy colored cartoony story of Monster Island, you know, this prison where you send all of the Kaijus to. Oh, wow. And, uh, but the thing, so it's all done in this bright candy color, kooky cartoon monsters. But the subject matter is as dark and as intense <laughs> and as dramatic as you could ever imagine. It is a straight up prison drama oh, with wow. prison rape and drug dealing and and shivs. And, I mean, imagine, it's just, imagine <laughs> HBO's Oz. Yes. Only, the, the, yes. only all, if they're all kaiju. Yeah. Right. Right. Super- it's HBO's Oz with the production design and coloring of the Wizard of Oz. I mean, yeah. it's just it's just striking, and I and I'm super fascinated by that by but the idea of on the surface. You know, having this one kind of thing going on, and and that's what draws you in, and then you subvert that. Like I, that was my favorite thing about about the project I did. Boilerplate is on the surface, it's just like whimsical robot. And he's got big round eyes, you know, like a Disney cartoon, and and oh, isn't it cute? He's running around with a rifle and fighting with Teddy Roosevelt. But then you read the text, and it's this very dark indictment about imperialism or whatever. You know, so so for me, though, those are my favorite kinds of projects. Like for instance, I was recently having a discussion with somebody about. The movie The A Team, and on this, which on the surface is like I would never, I'd never watch the show. I would never watch a movie like that. But it happened to be on, and I had it on in the background as I was working. And all of a sudden, I realized, oh my god, this is a crazy subversive film about actually... about the military, about the privatization of the military. Like the villains in the film are called Black Forest, yeah, <laughs> as in Blackwater. It, it's actually, oh. I, I think I've watched it recently, and I was sort of like blown away by like. Actually, this isn't. This is actually good. This is actually a, a political film <laughs> yeah. disguised as a, you know as some kind of you know action that, romp. That yeah. stuff sneaks up on you. I still maintain that the greatest comic book film of all time is actually Josie and the Pussycats. Agreed entirely. <laughs> I watched that movie three times in the theater. I love that movie. It is yeah. the best satire on a, like capitalist late stage capitalism. Wow, yeah. and, and, and 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 that to me is what makes you know is is what makes. Especially pop art, the kind of thing that you don't necessarily yeah. expect to have that. It's one thing, you know, if you're going to go to, you know, some, you know, academic bookstore and pick up this very weighty tome about whatever subject. It's another thing to see this candy colored movie on the same subject. Because yeah. <laughs> right. we were talking before about, like you were mentioning about how the best way to teach is, you know, through visuals, through comics and stuff like that. And, 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 and we've, we've come to understand through all of the late night political satire that the best way you get across your political points is with comedy. Is to mm-hmm. have Jimmy Kimmel talk about it. <laughs> so, so I mean, so there's really something powerful about about you know having this sort of frosting on your on your dense cake. Yeah, it's very engaging. I mean, I listen to a lot of true crime and the best true crime stuff podcasts, and it's, it's humor. Yeah. It, it treats, Last podcast on the left. Well, that one I, I have a few, few issues with. Oh, I should just a few. I yeah. <laughs> It's a little too, yeah. Uh, anyway, <laughs> is it the is it the constant uh, racist accents or the uh, you know jokes about the victims that really uh, the jokes you? about the victims? Yeah, yeah I, I, I happen. My, so, well, I only listened to one episode or what, like the first twenty minutes of the John Benet Ramsey episode, and then I had oh, to boy. shut it off. Yep. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm like my humor does not extend that far apparently, but um, I mean I mean more like. The, the the juxtaposition juxtaposition or subversiveness of certain texts I like that's what interests people and keeps people engaged right like you I like the idea that you can have art that is not necessarily just so dry and historical based you, you always have to have some kind of because it's narrative storytelling it's right. got to have that kind of uh, that I- interesting layer of human complexity to it and and even the other way and and, and it works also in the other way around if you're going to do a comedic piece you need to have some kind of dark streak or a dramatic 
a grounding in peace reality. To, yeah. to, to, to make it to make it something other than just ha ha. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I actually I was I saw this documentary on the making of car wash and it was so inspiring i went and saw the film itself and it was a, a revelation i hadn't seen it in a while because it was written as this complete farce with just a bunch of guys being goofs at a car wash but then when they brought in this black director to helm it and he rewrote the script and included this whole subplot be- about this black militant and all of a sudden the film became dimensional yeah. And, and and the last scene is where the militant tries to at, you know, when the car you know they all shut down it's at night and the militant comes to rob the to rob the car wash, and he's confronted by this this older black guy who is an ex con is trying to put his life back together again and they have this amazingly powerful scene and during it, uh, the militant f- finally breaks down and he and he just and he has this line. I don't know, man. I don't know. I know I'm not crazy. But every day I have to come here and watch this cloud show, man. Sometimes I just can't take it. I know. I know. And it recontextualizes the entire film. Yeah. And it's just like, oh my god. And so you know, pieces that are working on two levels like that, and not in an obvious way. Mm-hmm. I, I appreciate pieces that were on the surface. It's like, oh, this is what I'm in for, and then you, and then all of a sudden, you're taken over here. Yeah, it's like what? You figure it out like when you're walking to your car afterwards. <laughs> you're like, yeah. What did I just see there? Wait, wait, is that what the filmmaker was trying to tell me? Mm-hmm. I need to rethink my entire value system. <laughs> <laughs> totally. It's what we call a way homer. <laughs> Nobody calls it that. <laughs> they, did that, they did that one movie, which I'm going to sample and uh, insert the sound clip, but yeah. What movie? Well, oh, shit, man. I guess that's why they call it a way homer. Why is that? Because you only get it on the way home. I'm already home, man. You wet yourself, you wet yourself. Mr. McDonald wet himself, Daddy. I can't remember what it is. It's like, it's, it's called a way homer. They call it that because it's one you get on the way home. Or... Uh, oh, that was the fault in our summers. <laughs> <laughs> what? Your favorite film. <laughs> I um, should really see that. <laughs> they, they, the authors did come to town. My, t- I have two recommendations. Um, one is just got a recent. They um, hopefully they are still out on tour. Well, they're always out on tour. Um, I think their most recent tour came through Portland last week. The um, the, um, the two guys who run the Found Footage Festival uh, are, are are on tour. They they'll come through your town every either you know. Every year, every two years or so, but they always, they're, called, they're one of the guys who they will go out and they've been collecting just kind of like found VHS tapes. Give me, give me a nutshell. What do you guys do? In a, in a nutshell, Nick and I have been collecting videos for like 20 years now. I think it was like the early 90s. Nick stole a McDonald's training video from a McDonald's that he was working at, and that set the whole thing off. And, and we wanted more. And now we realize like, V- VHS tapes are at thrift stores everywhere right now, so yeah. we're going around the country and we're scooping up VHS tapes, and we show them to people. That's that's the, all and we these do. Are vid- I should explain these aren't VHS movies. It's not you know it's not a, a copy of Clueless on VHS that we're collecting. It's things that weren't meant to be seen in public, like exercise videos and training videos and other people's home movies. Wonderful bullshit. That's what we exactly. look for. Is wonderful, yeah. wonderful bullshit. And it- and we'll kind of like you know either like present little like one offs, um, or they'll like they'll like get like a, a bunch of tapes together on a theme, and kind of like put a, you know cut together a super cut of something and just present that. We in the most recent tour they did a thing called 101 Jesuses, which they just because they encounter so and were given so many um, uh, religious uh, you know you know kind of like evangelical Christian. Uh, productions of of suspect quality, uh, they just took the they just cut together like just uh, bits of like a hundred you know showing a hundred and one Jesuses of everything from like crappy anime CGI. There's one that's a stop mo you know there's a, there's a the Easter story only it's stop motion. Um, you know there's there are ones of like full on like you know there's there's there there are shots for, there are there are bits from. Um, Jesus Christ Superstar in there, but also mixed with like kind of like weird like sub uh, sub TBN 
um, level productions of uh, various Christmas stories. And it's, but yeah, but if you get a chance, um, check, and, I, and I'll even like include a link in the show notes. Find, watch the, the uh, go out and see the uh, the guys from the Found Footage Festival because they'll come and they'll mm. do like kind of like a like a like a live comedy show and just present just the in just batshit insane stuff that they will find that that's been on. Um, been on uh, VHS over the last from the VHS era. It is um, mm-hmm. as long as you know other stories about like what they do to entertain themselves when they are on tour because they'll like go out and they'll come up with some character. You know they'll, they'll come up with some character to introduce themselves and then try to amuse themselves and then contact local small market. Um, television you know like local news stations because they who need they need you know they need content to just try to get on the air in character of the like every tour they come up with some new you know some new little act that's completely them not know you know just you know like i said one time they had they had a guy who um claimed to be a yo-yo expert who was a one to be an uh, inspirational speaker to teach kids about the environment was their friend who of course who could not yo-yo to save his life yet they still took him on tour and had like you know six or eight um Appearances of him on local news stations of him like very obvious, looking like a Bruce McCullough character, very obviously failing to be a yo-yo expert, uh-huh. and the and then you get to see what the local the local uh, news people try you know who are just barely trying to hold it together, um, and like not really having no idea how to handle this guy, just kind of how do they react to this? So yeah, found footage fest worth your time. Okay. Uh, the other th- other recommendation is a book. Um, is a book called um, put out by Kathy O'Neill. It's called Weapons of Math Destruction, How Big Data Increases Inequality and Threatens Democracy. Uh, Kathy O'Neill um, was a, I guess you could call her a data scientist who really did get into, you know, you know, got her, you know, did a lot of like academic studies on, say, you know, algebra and number theory, got hired, was uh, got hired by a couple of hedge funds during the aughts and was kind of seeing how these things, you know, um, how when like algorithms were really starting to in an automation were really starting to take over more and more aspects of human life and like what they actually did and she goes through several each chapter is a different example of say how do you know how do like hedge fund algorithms like how do they how do they uh you know um how do they warp markets mm-hmm. In certain ways, beyond which the ways that you know most modern markets are already warped. How did the uh, how did say there's an entire uh, chapter about how the um, the U.S. News and World Report built their own little algorithm for you know the college ranking issue, which was you know started as just kind of like a weird gimmick issue, and at some point they built up the system and the ranking system and the algorithm and that to the point where it changed how some universities did business just you know try to, just to try to game this algorithm and get higher you know higher rankings mm-hmm. and it's this this it's I'm halfway through the book but it's kind of it is ultimately it's a very quick read it's ultimately it is both illuminating and terrifying yeah. because, the numbers aren't real stay woke y'all yeah <laughs> it's, I mean you could say there's even yeah, there is a the book was published last year so um, you know the well, you know <laughs> all the info that we found out about exactly how say the most you know the major electoral campaigns and how they used data science and voter micro targeting and modulating and the real successful outcomes that happened shout out to my boy Robbie Mook yeah uh, that's <laughs> you know that's I don't think she gets too ex- I, I haven't read too far into that because I'm, I'm so halfway through the book but yeah that's that's an example of what happens with like you know algorithms and data science and at one point it's um it's it's extremely uh, it's kind of a thing where it talks about how like people who ta- who have never heard the expression the map is not the land mm-hmm. of like you know take the mo- you know the model is only you know using the model as you know representative of of reality so uh, those are oh and yeah go see the uh, uh, if you haven't yet go see the latest Thor movie it's yeah. a lot of fun <laughs> just for you know Taika Waititi putting himself and several like bits of like you know uh, Maori, Maori and New Zealander culture into this um, you know like I said couple hundred thousand dollars a couple hundred couple hundred million dollar you know hollywood franchise and then you see and his character's just kind of like wandering around like in you know straight out of, of uh, out of one of his out of like you know one of one of his films like uh and also see see uh, see everything Ty, uh, taika waititi has ever made go yeah. see um hunt for the wilder people uh, hunt for the wilder what people they do in the shadows yes. what do in the shadows uh yeah which is uh, yeah watch this stuff but also it's the um 
uh, yeah, there's just the amount of just like I said, at this point, you know, there are so many, you know, Marvel superhero, uh, you know, superheroes, but also Marvel MCU films that I think my gauge of interest is how much batshit Jack Kirby, Jim Starlin, Walt Simonson, you know, like cosmic insanity can they? Um, it was I think which I think they really did it. For my money, it really started with uh, with Guardians of the Galaxy, mm-hmm. where they just said, "Fuck, it, we're putting the Eternals into this movie." Um, and then just kind of in Guardians of the Galaxy two had more of it, but in the the amount of like Cur- Kirby insanity that shows up in Thor Ragnarok is excellent, That's and great. yeah, and with the recently released Justice League movie, we now have two major studios putting out major um, comic franchises, which both have plot specific cosmic Kirby bits that are inherent in them. Mm-hmm. So that's um that is a that I think that um despite you know, regardless of the uh, of the um of the quality of the actual releases at least uh hopefully, you know Well I like that it was Kirby that created the overarching villains and cosmic aspects of both the Marvel and the DC universe. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Both of them. And it, and some people have talked about you know go what read you know going back and reading through his run on Thor like oh yeah this is very as they say re, this is very clearly Kirby is doing like dry runs of all of the, all of the you know the fourth world new god stuff mm-hmm. that he would do when he finally yep. stopped you know, wasn't able to put up with Stan Lee anymore and said screw you I'm going across That's the right. street. That's right because because I mean the it, it's it's just it breaks my heart that. Kirby left too early, and that Stanley got stuck around, who was only ever a marketer. He was only ever a marketer, and that he was able to, through over the years, slowly encroach on the credit for the creation of the Marvel Universe, right. of which he had very little to do with. And his contribution is the weakest aspect of, of like his bizarre and literative dialogue. <laughs> so, so, I mean, like if you've seen Kirby's pencils, he's the one that plotted it. He even, you know, if you see in the margin notes, he's the one that's that's directing Stan, you know, to write what whatever he writes. And if you look at each of those careers, Kirby had his career before and after Lee that was as successful as anything he did with Lee. And Lee had no career before or after Kirby. So, I mean, like, that right there is a pretty clear indication about who is the creative force mm-hmm. in that team. And so the idea of Kirby being, like, at this point, you know, not getting the full credit for creating both the Marvel and the DC Universe as we know it or as it's being exploited today in other media like movies and the you know, cartoon series and stuff like that. Actually, I've I've been watching the Justice League action and I'm enjoying it very much. It's a wonderful split between the original run of Tim uh, Tim um, Bruce Tim's animated series and Tim. the Brave and the Bold. So it's got the whimsy, but it's also got some drama. It's a nice little balance. It's a perfect Silver Age DC cartoon. Awesome. True. Yeah, as long yeah, as like I said, as long as the. Um that's one thing I've been trying to get into recently is going back and reading the old, uh, like finally reading the the Walt Simonson run on Thor, which yes. just for the the issue the the um, the when Mar when Marvel put out the like I said they put out the omnibuses, but they color correct them, so you really get a lot of like just insane insane vermilion and purple, um, like mid eighties pop art, but it's not you know not not subject to just you know to uh, to 30-odd-year-old 30, 30 year old aging newsprint. Mm-hmm. Right. Did you just call him Walt Simonson? Simonson. Okay. <laughs> oh, yeah, there's a lot of names. Sienkiewicz. Mm-hmm. Uh, Simonson. Call back. Uh, call back. We, we had the... We had the Sienkiewicz ar- yeah. argument <laughs> a while ago. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I have something to recommend. It's a, it's a thing you can see on iTunes and on Hulu. It's called 24 Hour Comic, oh, the yeah. movie. Oh, Jesus. I rented that myself. It's on <laughs> iTunes for four ninety nine. Starring, Go rent it. Starring Jacob with him, who's sitting right next to me. Starring David Chelsea <laughs> and Paul Guinan. You guys are in the IMDb. <laughs> oh, so. Yes. Well, I have. I think I have the least amount of dialogue. I think. I think uh, Chelsea's daughter has more dialogue than I have. <laughs> Chelsea's daughter is very talented. She's amazing. Yeah. Twenty four hour. Uh, I keep keep calling it call it twenty four hour party people, but no, that's <laughs> that's, that's a that's great not, film. I highly recommend that. Yeah. Any, that's anybody's interested in the in the in the origins of dance club culture, or the whole Mancunian sound in the eighties. You know, if you're into New Order, if you're into. Uh, uh, what is it? The Joy Division, Happy Joy Division, Mondays. yeah, all that. That's um, that's the film. I do wish the Stone Roses would have gotten more uh, more press, but they only had one really good album before right. Cocaine destroyed them. But you know, so it goes. <laughs> 
Um, no, that film also points out how destructive the drug scene was for all of us creative types. Mm -hmm. And um, which I thought was hilarious how um, Andy Serkis, who played. Um, yeah. Everything. Andy Circus. Andy Circus. Who, like I said, he uh, right before because it was announced right after as the movie was coming out. Andy Circus, who, who you know, a dramatic actor, plays Martin Hannett. A oh God, how would you? How I'm trying to think. Of how would you just? If you are, if well, most some, you know, plenty of you hearing this, you know, you know, know who the hell Martin Hannett was. Martin, what are you doing? <coughs> recording silence. You're recording silence. Well, now I'm recording Tony. Fucking Wilson. Um, we want you to produce a band for us. Who's us? Uh, Factory Records. Right, 50 quid an hour. Plus, I want to be a partner in the company. See ya. <coughs> See ya. But had a just a music producer who had a very... I'm getting there's a lot of there's a lot of there's a lot of people shaking their heads in the studio. No, no, I, I mean, I, I know him in the movie. In the movie, he's that scraggly haired perfectionist who's always giving people shit in the sound. Yeah, booth. he was. You know, he was insane. He was yeah. like I said, a very particular and just ins had this insane. Yeah. Even now, like insane. <laughs> Listen to listen to listen to. I uh, think even back then he had he had enough. Uh, enough of a reputation that if you listen to listen to not Nazi punks fuck off <laughs> where Jello Biafra first says Nazi punks fuck off overproduced by Martin Hannett take four <laughs> before they they launch into it and then fuck up and try to get him but it's like yeah he gets called out in the middle of a you know a dead kennedy song but it's just first you know but they, they just they chose andy circus who represent played him in the movie and then right after that they're like oh yeah by the way he's gonna be gollum <laughs> too and just the fact that the guy who played martin hannett is also gonna be gollum and you know it was so yeah go see uh go see 24-hour party people too and go see uh 24-hour comic uh 24-hour 24 24-hour comic movie yes yep. that's it i'm scott mcleod and i'm a cartoonist and author best known for my book understanding comics i came up with the 24-hour comic in 1990 as a challenge for my friend steve Bissett. let's see if each of us can draw 24 pages in 24 hours. The the one the only documentary I've ever seen where time the time passing is marked by disappearing donuts yes. out of a box. Yes, and all that was post produced. There was no donuts on site at the time. <laughs> okay, that's bullshit. Do I not? That's not true. Uh -huh. I, I well, there, well, at least the shots the shots of the donuts. He bought that. Oh yeah, no, there box. were donuts on scene. He just didn't right, use right. Those. And yeah. so 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 he he at a separate point in time he buys a box of donuts and <laughs> then, and, and then puts the camera on a tripod and then one by one. <laughs> <laughs> Ate the donuts. Did you know that Andy Serkis' birthday commitment. is 420? Oh, that's great. <laughs> I thought that the was same, the same. That was Taylor Hiller's birthday, right? Though. Like, yeah. Well, like I mean, more than one person can. Yeah. Have also, like, also, <laughs> yeah. It's, like it wasn't like they weren't born in the same year. Like I know. <laughs> also, the uh, release date for the newly not well the, the the release date for the the cinematic adaptation of Rampage starring The Rock. Where he really does go out, you know, the the same done by the San, people who made San Andreas. He goes out, you know, has to fight off a giant, uh, a giant gorilla, Is a lizard? giant lizard, yeah. and a giant wolf. I love that game. Trashing a, okay. um, trashing a city. All right, it's the best game because you punch it in the windows. Punch, punch, punch. Yeah, and if and, or you, yeah, if you punched a sign, if it wasn't lit, you could eat like you know, if it was a neon sign of like a hot dog. If it wasn't lit, you could grab it and you could eat the hot dog. Yeah. If it was lit, you'd you get, get electrocuted, electrocuted and uh, and uh, and damaged. That game was very woke. You know, it was presenting things from the monster's perspective. I respect mm -hmm. that. Yeah, and they had male and female representation equal. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, that's okay. well. It's well. That's two out of two out of three ain't bad, but yeah. yeah. All right, and um. Uh, I guess wrapping up. Uh, uh, I guess how um, how can folks how can uh, Paul how can folks get a hold of you? Bigredhair dot com, bigredhair dot com. Uh, my email is guinan at bigredhair dot com. My Patreon is patreon dot com slash guinan. Actually, I was very happy that Patreon that no one on Patreon had used guinan because that's a Star Trek character name. I would have thought all character names from Star Trek would have been s snapped up. So I'm very happy. probably just yeah. couldn't spell it. <laughs> that's You're right. on Twitter too, right? Yeah, yeah, well, yeah that's right, Twitter. But uh, yeah, I, I, I did my, I got my. I suppose I could change my Twitter handle at some point, but it's boilerplate eighteen ninety three, which is a reference to my robot and the year that he was manufactured. Nice. And then Aztec Empire fifteen twenty, another Twitter feed, 
And then if you really want to go deep cuts, after the Trump election, I had to stop my political feeds because everybody else was doing them. I didn't want, I just want, I didn't want to be, you know, a 2,172nd guy to retweet that thing that everybody's retweeting. Yeah. So, but I still f needed to yell at f the Fox News mm -hmm. feed, you know, so I set up my own personal political feed, which I call the Red Hornet and that's on Twitter, and that's just me railing at the world with my thirty followers. I love it. <laughs> so, it's all, it's all. I've got th three freaking Twitters. Uh, at least, Jesus, at least, at least your color choice is good. I um, yeah, it's like I, oh, went I, I, I went to town with it because I got the logo from the Green Hornet, color corrected it to red, and then I found a, a still from one of the episodes, in which they're holding up uh, the Daily Sentinel. And it's and the headline is uh, is uh, Green Hornet is shot. And I switched the headline to just say I found Green Hornet. And, you know, like once you actually get to that little custom graphic, I was very proud. Awesome. Of that. Very proud of that. Nice. <laughs> Looking it up now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and the and yeah, because it's, so it's the Red Hornet, but uh, with the little with the little Green Hornet logo is red. And uh, but that was taken up as a Twitter handle, so I had to change the spelling to. Reed Hornet, as in Britt Reed, whose secret identity is the Green Hornet. And founded Reed University. Reed College. There you go. And who actually, in, in the canon of Green Hornet, he is the cousin, or, ne or he's related to the Lone Ranger. That sounds about right. Because the Lone Ranger and the Green Hornet were both created by the same guy. So, in the 1930s or whatever. Yeah. And so, uh, so, he had, so he was the first, he was one of the first non-comics shared medium like shared universe kind of, you know a hero thing and then that all got evolved into this thing called the wold newton universe which i will leave for another discussion oh look, boy look that up yeah, the right. wold newton universe in which everybody's related so sherlock holmes is related to so and so and everybody has this like um it all comes out of this idea that there was in wold county england there was this meteor in 1800 or whatever and that all of all all the public domain heroes like alan quartermain or mm -hmm. whoever all are connected to that event or right. descendants of and that's why there's they have these super heroic abilities because they were exposed to some meteor radiation some meteor shit as uh stephen king said right and they well, and and they're you know they were all the dream of a young of a young boy with uh <laughs> learning disabilities staring into a snow globe. snow globe that's right that's exactly right yeah it was all assembled together by uh philip jose farmer who wrote two books tarzan alive and doc savage's apocalyptic life which were presented as straight biographies of these fictional characters as if they were real and that, that was actually right. that actually that's called back to boilerplate because that was an inspiration as a kid reading those books about the idea of presenting your fictional thing as if true history yeah as if it's you know this guy really existed like yeah. like phil jose farmer actually wrote the empire state building and said who was your tenant on the 86th floor in 1936 and they go well, as far as we know it's always been the observation deck and jose farmer in his book is like yeah yeah, that's what that they say. But really, it was Doc Savage headquarters. We we all know that. Mm -hmm. But he printed the letter that he got from the Empire State Building <laughs> nice. in the book, <laughs> like, a, like a Laszlo letter. Yeah, that's great. Uh, J uh, Jacob Daly, you guys want to share anything or I'm, any like con contact or? I'm at Jacob Mercy on Twitter. I also have a political uh, Twitter. It's a satire oh. one. It's uh, at Real Donald Trump. Uh, I'm a little bit worried about that. People are kind of taking it too seriously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a well, popular one. Yeah, it's it's it is getting a little crazy though lately. I think you're pushing you're pushing it. It's hard for me to up the answer. That whole thing about how you want to be King it? Kim Young's friend. Oh, I oh. wish I was his friend. Oh, too bad. Maybe one day I could be his friend. That's a good bit. I'm proud of that bit. That was that made me laugh. Yeah. I was laughing. Are you, are you looking at me? In <laughs> um, the. Oh, it's your turn, and if you. If. Oh, yeah. I'm at. <clears throat> excuse me. Let me cut this part. I'm sorry. I'm at Ashes for Foxes on t um, Twitter and Tumblr. Oh. Is and that a is that a Rilo Kylie reference? Um, portions for foxes. Yeah. yeah, I mean Ashes for Foxes. I always replace that because that's all I provide you with. No yeah. portions. Um, <laughs> so, uh, I've recently uh, quietly launched my own podcast. Um, we are at Meta Machina. M E T A M A S H I N A, and that's three girls talking about genre fiction, talking about the female gaze, being heavily critical. Uh, it's not safe for work. We do get into some very heated subjects, including stuff like the kink around Pennywise the Clown from It. And, uh, okay. 
All right. <laughs> yep. Yep. So you've been fairly warned. Um, but yeah, check us out. Yeah. Awesome. And as always, um, uh, if you have anything you want to email to the show, you can reach us at giving the mic at Gmail. We do have a Patreon, ladies and gentlemen, uh, patreon.com slash giving the mic. Uh, we have a YouTube channel, which is just me posting the audio from these episodes for anybody who wants to listen in on YouTube and not you, uh, to say you can safely use your work bandwidth and not your phone bandwidth to hear it. Um, I don't think I'm any, we're on Twitter somewhere. Find us there. <laughs> um, all right. Then I think I want to thank my guests for this uh, lovely extended conversation here. Uh, any uh, any final words? Justice League in theaters now. Check it out. <laughs> Support Barkles the dog. Yeah. <laughs> yes, all of the above. D. All right. Good night, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. from our music budget. 700 grand. <laughs> well, goodbye. We obviously have nothing in common. I'm a genius. You're fucking wankers. You'll never see me again. You don't deserve to see me again. Martin? <laughs> <laughs>